Good afternoon, everybody, or good morning, wherever you're at. I'm glad to be here today and talk about Spine Leaf Networks. And the short presentation is a primer, and it'll get you pretty excited about uh, these kinds of designs and what you can expect to see in the field. This is not a fully expansive uh, discussion, but it's definitely get, get things going uh, as you think through some of the designs in network architecture. So I'm glad to be here, and I'm glad you're here as well. Let's get started. So where does spine leaf come from? What's interesting is that it was a very old school uh, thinking here, 1938, as you see in the slide, and it had a pretty simple premise that we had a lot of circuits to connect and that was necessary to create a environment or a topology that allowed for that. So the two main guys that you hear about is Erwin and Kloss, and you'll hear Kloss a lot in Google searches, uh, as you uh, go and search this topic. The idea here is to create an environment where you have an ingress connection into a middle uh, connection and then to an egress. And this spine leaf environment, as we'll see here in the future slides as we go through, created a circuit that allowed connections and calls to happen uh, and scale pretty large. This crossbar idea which is the middle, really talks about how you can connect the inbound calls to the outbound calls. Now, this is circuit switching. So the circuit is fully used just like your old school telephone that cannot be used by anybody else. That circuit is completely allocated and you needed a new circuit for a new call. As you can see here, this was adopted for phone services initially back in the 50s. Here, I actually explain a little bit more about what this looks like. So here on the top left corner, you'll actually see uh, the number one representing the call is entering in the ingress crossbar uh, or this switch here. And then it has a connection that is free and is not being utilized. And it's going to go into the middle crossbar, which is represented by the number two. Again, we're looking for a progression of this call to egress to its destination or to make the connection. Again, we're looking for a clear and open circuit that's going to allow this complete call to go through. And um, once it's completely done through the ingress, the middle, and the egress connection, you have a full circuit. Now, this idea of middle stage, egress stage, and ingress stage um, is very important as we look at it in the IP networks and as we switch over to packet switching. So this is again, still focusing on circuit switching and the original technology that was designed for it. Let's move on. Okay, so let's dig into circuit versus packet switching. So again, packet switching is what we use nowadays. Uh, we were always into looking at packet captures, looking at trace routes. These are individual packets that have headers, uh, that have information of IP addressing, and their destination information, as well as the data they carry. So what, what you want to take away from this is that although circuit switching is something that was used in the past, it still has relevance into packet switching. That's why we're talking about CLOS networks today. It's something that was old but is now new again and we'll better understand what this provides us and what it overcomes with normal networks uh, that are normally fat tree topologies so here we want to make sure that packet switching uh, that you know that in this particular slide we're trying to communicate that packet switching is the primary basis for data communications and it's no longer circuit switching let's see a little bit of a demo of how this works so here we have three packets that are making their way through the network. They can go in different directions because each packet has the ability to egress different nodes and end up in its destination. This particular idea then makes the communications not circuit driven where one connection between node A and node D in this example would be one connection that when used is no longer available for anybody else to use. Here we have these three different packets traversing multiple nodes, and those decisions are 
primarily based on what we what information we give it, what kind of routing protocols we use, what kind of bandwidth we have. As you guys already know, that networks aren't uh, just plug and play, they require administration, hence why we're all learning about networks and becoming rock stars. So here we actually see this particular small graphic, although kind of um, simplistic, it does communicate the fact that we could go through multiple directions, even directions we wouldn't have considered like the particular green packet that makes its way from node A to node E to node G back down to node H down to the host. That's not something that was something that we're, when we're looking at this, we'd want that to diverse. But if that link was in better quality than the link between node E and node H, that's a good decision. And ultimately it gets the packet where it needs to with lower latency and speed. So again, hopefully this makes that point and drills that home. Let's get into a little bit more technical uh, look at this. So this is a very busy slide, but there's a lot to cover. So SpineLeaf and an IP network solution has, in this scenario, has two stages. Now you can grow that leaf to leaf um, into three, four, five stages, and we'll look at some examples of different uh, companies that do that in the further slides. But mainly you wanna understand that the stages represent how many hops away I am from leaf to leaf. Now, key point here is that uh, leafs can connect to one another if you have a certain topology like dual connected, um, uh, what do you call servers? Also, it makes sense if you have the uh, what do you call connection between uh, the spine and leaf obviously has to be there. And then the the actual spines do not connect to one another because again, they're representing a crossbar connection to the leaves. Things go, uh, all traffic goes in and out of leaves. As we see here in the top right, we have another uh, egress leaf that has a couple internet connections and that provides the uh, north to south traffic. Normally, um, you'll see a lot of spine leaf environments, uh, east to west traffic. It was initially de designed for data centers, um, and it's been expanded into campus networks, as we'll see here in the next coming slides. But moving on to the next point here, ECMP is a key point here. E, um, external BGP versus IBGP is used, it's more common, and it's a little bit simpler to use. Some of the failover mechanisms exist there. Uh, so as you see here with the spine and the leaves will have different AS numbers, and then they have the use of these multiple connections. Now this is normally a layer three fabric. Uh, so that overcomes the spanning tree issues with uh, like who's the root, uh, you know, actually shutting down ports because of redundancy and then op only opening them up when you have the correct BPDUs or something's, so there's a failure in the network. That loop detection is no longer necessary if you're running a layer three fabric. You can use technologies like BFD um, if you have that available in your hardware. And then BGP timers are tweaked outside of a external BGP reference like, uh, like providers, we wanna change that into our data centers, our campus environments. So we wanna tweak those things a little bit lower so we can have quicker uh, reconvergence. Now, what does this all do? So the first time I was exposed to this was actually at um, a, a past life at Dell where we were modernizing their networks. They had a heavy layer two fabric so we switched it over to a spine leaf environment, very similar to what you see here in concept, where we had the spines and the leaves connected via layer three fabric, which then allowed the servers that I represented here very, very, uh, very simplistically, so they could connect into the environment potentially uh, with an overlay network. So this layer three fabric allows us to prime our networks for overlay networks where we can, uh, prepare for the future, and also keep in mind that we have older applications that needed layer two connectivity. So this idea of the layer three fabric that is an underlay is something that you'll normally hear when you hear about spine leaf networks. So this underlay creates an environment where it's simplistic, it's deterministic, we know how many hops we are from uh, leaf to leaf, we have something that's potentially automated because it has very similar characteristics throughout the entire uh, environment and it scales. This is a two stage. 
uh, you could continue to grow the spines and then have layers that create an ability to have non-blocking um, connections. So in this diagram, I show some speed information here, and that's mainly just to communicate to you that the speeds and feeds matter. You want to create an environment that's not oversubscribed or undersubscribed. No one's going to be really happy with you if you're spending a lot of money and you're not really using it versus you didn't spend enough money or didn't spend enough uh, on the architecture and things are running slow. So non-blocking um, non blocking and un undersubscribed or subscribed networks that make sense, that's where the speeds and feeds come in. So with this in mind, you have to architect this underlay almost like a foundation to a house to then create these overlay networks which use EVPN, VXLAN, which you guys will hear later on today. So this is a very interesting uh, shift. This is the same concept that we looked at that was originated back in the 30s and 50s by uh, those, those very key guys, those pioneers for those circuit networks. Now we're using them in IP-based networks along with BGP, along with ECMP, equal cost multipath, maybe even some bidirectional forwarding detection, BFD for failures and timers to create a very stable, uh, deterministic, non-layer two environment that makes it simple to scale and also to create an environment where you can lay on top an overlay network like EVPN. I think I've covered this slide. There is some references there, great reading materials, RFCs um, if you got a lot of coffee, and FRR is a free range routing. It's an open source routing protocol that is uh, you can download into your favorite Linux package. Uh, this is, again, just a little bit of a primer. We can dig into each one of these very extensively, but we don't have time for that today. But let's move on and see some cool examples of how this is done um, outside of this um, discussion. So putting it all together, here's uh, Cumulus, another vendor that uh, has a campus design that uses BGP unnumbered, which is a very cool way of using your loopback as a reference. And it uh, allows for interconnectivity between uh, nodes coming in and out. I did use this in my time in the military. Unnumbered uh, was something we actually used to uh, accommodate people or units coming in and out. Now it's adapted into this campus environment where you have a border leaf, an egress, and then you have some internet connections. There is a layer three to layer two uh, split. Moving on, this is uh, another example. This is Facebook's engineering page. They're linked, very extensive. And here we have a very extensive look at a spine plane with egress links, edge switches, rack switches, pods, and edge pods. As you can see, this diagram is very detailed and very layered upon it. And as you can see, as, as you look at how you can use spine leaf, you can scale it to massive data centers as we see here with Facebook's engineering page. I will say that the particular link that I have there, very interesting read, um, and it yields, it, you do have this as a final slide. And as you see from left to right, each one of those uh, panes of glass, if you will, represent those top of rack switches, which tie to fabric switches, which are then tied into uh, the uplink switches or edge switches to egress the network. And hence, you can check your Facebook feed. So this is a pretty cool picture and very interesting if you want to geek out on how Facebook actually works and how it's architected. There's additional information here on the physical layout of a data center if that's what you're getting into. Okay, moving on. This is Cisco's ACI approach, very similar. Um, this is along with AWS data centers with a technology um, or a, an offering called AWS Outpost. Uh, over there on the left, I have a couple slides there, but Cisco's ACI also, again, uses a spine leaf environment, which then overlays their ACI technologies with a whole bunch of different uh, bells and whistles there as well. Uh, the links, like I said, will provide additional information and a couple PDFs that actually will walk through this design. Uh, this is the Nexus 9000 ACI, and it creates, uh, this is mainly around using ACI within AWS Outposts, which is basically a rack that lives in your premise. Definitely useful for folks that are worried about security and keeping access to their particular um, data. Still EVPN, VXLAN, uh, BGP, very much intertwined into this solution as well. 
wrapping it up on the pulling it all together, the data center, again, also has a option with Juniper Networks, again, using AWS's Outpost and how that all works together. Again, not to be redundant, this is just another uh, option that you have to use those particular um, hardware, which is the Q QFXs, QFX 5Ks, 10Ks uh, are used in this scenario. And they, they show you how they're tying everything together within the EC2 instance, the on-prem rack and AWS. Very interesting and very um, exciting. Okay, so I'm opening it up to questions, um, comments, or concerns. I know that's a lot that we covered and we went by it pretty quickly. Um, it's just an idea. I want to get you guys thinking about the spine leaf networks as you go into the field. You'll see them. Maybe you'll even see them in campuses now, which is something I've been seeing over the last couple of years from data center to campus um, is, is what we've been seeing. So I'm opening it up to questions and taking it from there. Jacob S. here. Thank you for watching the video. I hope you really enjoyed it. And I'd also like to remind you, if you're truly serious about your career in information technology, then be sure to check out our IT engineer training programs at www.02engineer.com.